From ruthless leaders to treacherous spies, all the way to government scandals and even the leader of a cult, this list truly does have it all. Welcome back to Bumblebee, join me today as we count down the top 10 scandalous people in history that did unspeakable things. Starting off this list, in our number 10 spot we have Nero. For this one we are taking it all the way back to the age of the Roman Empire. When we think back to these times, they weren't necessarily the most kind, peaceful of times, but there certainly are some characters that stand out as being particularly brutal. And one of those is Nero. Throughout his reign, he wreaked havoc on the Roman Empire, he burned cities, he killed thousands of people, including every member of his own family, and I mean, we know the inventive execution methods of the past, so you can probably guess at just how brutal these all were. Most Roman sources give us an almost completely negative review of him in reference to both his personality and his reign as a leader. He was called compulsive and corrupt, and it is believed that he is actually to blame for the great fire that burned Rome but instead he used the Christians as a scapegoat so that they would receive punishments rather than him. In the end, after being declared a public enemy by the Roman Senate and realizing that the rebellion would be lost, he ended up taking his own life at the age of 30. In our number 9 spot today, we have Shoko Asahara. Leader of the Om Shinriko cult, this person claimed to be the reincarnation of the Hindu god Shiva. He said that he was destined to lead his followers to salvation once the apocalypse came, but then once he lured in followers, he claimed that he could only also teach them to levitate and develop telepathic abilities seems very legit. Apparently, those who were the most skeptical, he allowed them to drink his bath water. No idea why or what this was supposed to be for, and I wish I could unlearn it to be honest, but now we all just have to suffer with that information together. The cult continued to grow and drew in influential and wealthy people, and what did he do? Well, he made a science division of this cult, and this is where they studied the microorganisms living in his bathwater. I'm just kidding, it was actually really messed up. The group went on to attack Tokyo in 1994, which took the lives of seven people. Then, in 1995, they released gas into the Tokyo underground, which led to 12 deaths, 50 injured people, and more than 5,000 people with temporary vision problems. In the end, he and 11 of his disciples ended up being arrested and charged, and they were all sentenced to death in 2004. In our number eight spot, today we have Victoriano Alvarez. Clipperton Island was an island that is located in the Pacific, and during the 18th and 19th century, everyone was trying to lay claim to it and rule it. I'm talking about Britain, France, Mexico, and of course, our friend Victoriano. He was actually the lighthouse keeper on the island, and in 1910, when Mexico needed to stop sending vital supplies to the island because they were focused on the rising revolution happening there, most of the inhabitants ended up contracting scurvy, which sadly led to their death. In the end, only Victoriano, a small group of soldiers, and a about 12 women and children were left. The soldiers ended up passing away shortly after in an accident, so you know what Mr. Lighthouse did? He threw all but one of the rifles into the sea, loaded the one remaining weapon, and like the worst person he is, he declared himself king of the island. From here, he went on to kill anyone who disagreed with him, and he was also extremely harmful to the women who unfortunately were left on the island. That was, until one badass woman named Tirza Randon simply had enough. She found a hammer and and, well, the rest is history. In our number 7 spot today, we have Richard Nixon. This is perhaps one of the largest scandals and leaks in history, especially in the history of the United States. In the middle of 1972, there were five men who were arrested for breaking into and subsequently trying to bug the Democratic National Committee headquarters at the Watergate Hotel Complex in Washington, D.C. As the year went on, the 1972 presidential election came closer, and there was an anonymous source who fed information to Washington Post reporters Carl Bernstein and Bob Woodward that, quote, the Watergate bugging incident stemmed from a massive campaign of political spying and sabotage conducted on behalf of President Nixon's re-election and directed by officials of the White House. Despite this information leak and it being reported in the news, Nixon was still re-elected, but he was also under serious investigation. There were a series of Senate hearings, and the Senate even went on to create a special investigative committee. The hearings were broadcast nationwide, and they had witnesses testifying that Nixon had approved plans to cover up administration involvement in the break-in, and that there was a voice-activated taping system in the Oval Office. These hearings captured the attention of Americans everywhere for weeks, and in the end, the United States Supreme Court ruled that Nixon had to release these Oval Office tapes to government investigators, which then went on to reveal that he had not only attempted to cover up what went on, but he also later tried to use federal officials to deflect the investigation. Under the threat of an imminent impeachment, Nixon 
Nixon had no choice but to admit his guilt and resign, making him the only president to do so. His successor, Gerald Ford, ended up pardoning him so he escaped prosecution, but there were 69 other people indicted, with 48 of them later being convicted. Remember that anonymous source who spilled the information in the first place? Well, his identity remained a secret for 33 years until 2005 when former FBI agent Mark Felt revealed himself as the source. This is probably the biggest political scandal in US history and it revealed corruption beyond what Americans at the time could believe. It truly changed the way that people would look at government leaders forever. In our number 6 spot today we have Kurt Gödel. The Austrian American philosopher and mathematician Kurt Gödel lived from 1906 to 1978 and he made quite a name for himself. Being compared to the likes of Aristotle and Einstein, he is best known for his incompleteness theorem, which was a very significant mathematical result. He was obviously very successful and found himself teaching and educating a younger generation, but his personal life is where things got quite dark. When he was just 6 years old, he had a case of rheumatic fever which left him quite ill for the rest of his childhood. This led to him first being pretty preoccupied with his health, and unfortunately this turned into hypochondria which then led him down a path of complete paranoia. He ended up having an irrational fear of getting poisoned, so to avoid this he would only eat food that had been prepared by his wife who also had to taste it beforehand. Sadly, his wife was hospitalized in 1977 for 6 months which obviously left her unable to prepare food for him. Because of the fact that she was unable to do this for him, during this period he refused to eat, which eventually led to him starving to death. In our number 5 spot today we have Albert Fall. Albert Fall was the Secretary of the Interior to former President Warren G. Harding, and while in this position, he decided to secretly allow oil companies to tap into the Teapot Dome Oil Reserve in Wyoming and the Elk Hills Oil Reserve in California. Of course, the reason he did this is because he could make a ton of extra money doing this, like several hundred thousand dollars. This all started to unravel though in 1922 when there was an expose that revealed that the oil had been sold without any sort of competitive bidding. After this expose, Robert La Follette, who was a senator from Wisconsin, created an investigation into the story by the Senate Committee on Public Lands. The Attorney General at the time, Harry Dougherty, began to get some flack for not investigating this alleged corruption, so Harry turned to the FBI director to help him out. The FBI director, William J. Burns, sent an agent to Robert, the senator from Wisconsin's office, to search for anything that could be used to blackmail him into stopping the investigation into the corruption. Despite this seemingly obvious threat, Robert knew that this meant that his investigation was going to reveal something serious which motivated him to continue on with it. In the end, the shady dealings and all of the bribery was revealed and Albert Fall was officially exposed. This entire ordeal led to him being the first United States cabinet secretary to go to prison. In our number 4 spot today we have Velvely Dickinson. Velvely is a name I've never heard before and I thought it sounded kind of cool and nice until I heard about the person it belonged to. Velvely is one of the reasons why we should never judge a book by its cover. On the outside, she appeared to be like a regular older lady who ran a doll store. Who would think the owner of a doll store would ever be a villain? Okay, maybe everyone. But anyway, as far as I know, everything started out more normal, but once her husband passed away from a heart attack, things took a very sinister twist as she started to take on some interesting side projects for a little extra cash. In 1942, the FBI was able to intercept a letter that was on its way to Buenos Aires. The letter spoke of a quote, wonderful doll hospital and quote, three old English dolls and the FBI was like, hey, that's kind of weird. So their cryptographers went to work and it was uncovered that this letter was actually sent in code. As it turns out, these letters were actually sending military secrets to Japan and some of the information within them would have been extremely valuable if the letter hadn't been intercepted and never delivered. Turns out that Velvely had visited the Japanese Institute in New York, befriended the Consul General and connected with a Japanese naval attache. The FBI arrested Dickinson and upon doing so, they found huge amounts of cash along with the instructions for the code she was to use in the letters. She ended up being sentenced to 10 years in prison. In our number 3 spot today we have Monica Witt. Monica is a former United States Air Force technical sergeant as well as defense contractor who has been on the run since 2018. Despite her high ranking position and high security clearance, she is on the run because she defected to Iran in 2013. It is said that from 2013 up until she was found out that she was using her position in order to spy on the United States and relay 
relayed that information back to the group she was working for. She used different fake Facebook accounts, and it is said that the information she gave included the classified true name and counterintelligence activities of a US intelligence operative. This is of course a problem regardless of how important this operative was, but it is said that this information she shared had the potential to cause serious damage to United States national security. It truly is an absolutely wild story, and Monica is still out there on the run, hiding from the consequences of her betrayal and espionage. In our number two spot today, we have Irene of Athens. Taking it back to the Byzantine Empire, Irene of Athens was the mother of Constantine VI, and while the pair co-ruled together for almost two decades, things ended in quite the tragedy. After the pair co-ruled, Irene did go on to rule on her own from 797 to 802 CE, but you might be wondering how she managed to outrule her son. Well, Irene, the ambitious ruler, wanted full control all to herself, so she asked for the help of some political allies to pull off a scheme against her own son. She began to lead a conspiracy against him to try and get him out of power. The duo did end up reconciling their relationship, but this is not where the story ends. In 786, the public began to turn their backs on Constantine because he had decided to divorce his wife and instead marry his mistress. Irene saw this as a second chance and once again chose to conspire against her own son. Honestly, fool me once, shame on me. Fool me twice, this lady did not care. Here's where things in the story get exceptionally gory though. Irene not only ordered the arrest of her son, but also ordered that his eyes be gouged out. Yep, that's how good old Mumsy came into power. Finally, in our number one spot today, we have Boy Jones. Okay, I've heard of people being called Boy Jones before, but little did I know Boy Jones was a very real and very creepy person. His full name was Edward Jones, and this little rascal basically stalked the Queen from 1838 to 1841. He managed to break into Buckingham Palace, and we aren't just talking about once, we are talking about many many times. He knew exactly where to go and what to do, and once in the castle, well, he would hide under the queen's sofa, he would sit on her throne, and worst of all, he would go through her clothing. Like a little creep. He even went as far as to steal her clothes, which is just stupid, of course. Taking evidence of your crimes is bad practice. Thankfully, he did finally get caught, but man, a few years of sneaking in and sitting on the throne. That's crazy. All right, guys, that has been our list for today. Thanks so much for checking it out. I've been your host today, Olivia Kozlowski, and I will see you again soon. Bye.